As men of science, having logic and reason, we have no need for the Bible now, right? Well, I guess we're done here. Hey everyone, JL here, and welcome back to Bridge the Divide, where I examine irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that follow, and how we, with education, rationality, and reason, can bridge the societal divides that they create. Now, from all of your recent comments and reactions, I know how much all of you love the Wu debunking videos. And I promise we will get back to them. I mean, when you hear dangerous idiocy like this being put out into the world. I worked with a medical intuitive, and she said every time she sees someone with Lyme, it's an intergalactic substance, and it's literally bringing in codes from the beginning of time. Lime is a gift. Yes, yes. It is not for the faint of heart. No. And it is for the most deeply spiritual people yes. on the planet. Yes. How could I possibly not address it? But for this one, we're going to take a quick break from the woo and address yet another TikTok Christian. And he claims to absolutely have evidence for his God. This is Ryan Bushman Townsend, or as he's better known on TikTok, Dead Hidden. And while I normally like to introduce the subjects of my videos personally, this time I'm going to let Ryan have that honor, because he does it so much better than I ever could. My name is Ryan, and this is my main source of transportation. No electric, no sewer, no trash, no services. This is what we do for a living, but I'm also a perfumer, because perfume done right is good for you. I'm recording a progressive metal album with musicians around the world. Jesus. Christ is my Lord and Savior. Welcome to my paradigm. Right. So Ryan here dropped a video where he claims to have absolute proof for God. Let's see if this Kirkland's Coyote Peterson has the goods. And I do mean other than the dry ones, he obviously has cash for the winner in his root cellar. Evidence of God. Look, if you don't think there's evidence for the existence of God and you have any sense in your head at all, I'm about to break your heart. Break my heart? But we've barely gotten to know each other, Ryan. I'm hardly that invested. Oh, you meant by presenting evidence that your God exists. Well, seeing as how I'm more interested in believing things that are true as opposed to things that aren't, if your God exists and you have sufficient evidence to support that, then that would make the existence of your God something that was true. So it wouldn't really break my heart, now would it? A good example of sufficient evidence, Ryan, would be you espousing this preconceived notion about what would break an atheist's heart. Because you making that claim would be sufficient evidence enough for me to make the claim that you're either being intellectually dishonest about what atheism is, or you don't really understand what it is and what it entails. Either way, you're already working from a dishonest foundation, and I really want to see if that foundation biases the rest of your little presentation. Now I know we've gone through great lengths to discredit the Bible, and rightly so, it's modern times, right? As men of science, having logic and reason, we have no need for the Bible now, right? Well, people have been questioning the Bible for hundreds of years. From the unsupported claims, to the scientific inaccuracies, to the failed prophecies, to the influence that powerful families and political groups have had on the book during its long history of translations and interpretations. Generally, people tend to question the validity of the Bible based upon one simple observation. And that is how a supposed omniscient and eternal entity could get so much wrong about the world it supposedly created, left so much more about the world it created out of the book, failed to see these as the roadblocks they would be in the future, and continued to demand that people commit the worst mistakes in human reasoning to justify a belief in it. Instead of just showing up, laying all the cards on the table, and allowing human beings to make the informed decision about whether or not to worship it. You know, all that stuff that being an eternal omniscient entity would logically preclude. I tell you, like current interest rates, those logical entailments are killer, aren't they? Now before I get to the material scientific evidence of the existence of God, I want you to consider one thing first. Whoa, 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 Mr. Plus One at the Alaska Militia Ball. Why exactly would you need to put a caveat on your evidence? If the evidence is solid, then it shouldn't require any prerequisites to accept it. It would naturally stand on its own merits. You may want to retrace your steps there, Zebco. I fear that you dropped that logic and reason you so carelessly referred to earlier somewhere on the trail. 
Let's just back up for one second, look at history. Before we find out where we are right now, can we please? Well, no, because historical anecdotes are not very good as far as sufficient evidence goes. The worst part of a simple historical anecdote is that even if there was a tremendous amount of effort put into recording the event as it took place, and that record actually survived the centuries to make it to us and was still decipherable, unless those records allow us to verify a claim through replication of a process or directly reference to other archaeological evidence, then they're just anecdotes that should be taken with a grain of salt. Also, it's kind of weird that this poster boy for steep and cheap would need to preface his evidence with anything, especially evidence for God. When the Roman Catholic Church translated the Bible into a document known as the Latin Vulgate, they took the Hebrew and the New Testament Greek and translated it into Latin. For some context here, Constantine I was the first emperor to convert to Christianity. He legalized the practice of Christianity in 313 CE, and he unified the Catholic Church in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. From there, Christianity became the state religion in 380, and in 382, Jerome of Striden was commissioned by Pope Damasus I to revise and translate the Vedas Latina. And by 390, under his own initiative, Jerome had turned to translating the Hebrew Bible, the books that make up the Old Testament, into Latin. And he worked that translation from the original Hebrew, not from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Jerome did this because a few Christians regarded the Septuagint as full of mistranslations that contained Hellenistic heretical elements. This, of course, is a prime example of the subjective nature of the book, because Jerome's position ran counter to many other Christians including Augustine, who considered the Septuagint as divinely inspired. So Jerome translated the New Testament from Old Latin to Latin, and he translated the Old Testament not from the Greek, but from Hebrew to Latin. If you're going to reference Catholic history, Ryan, it pays to know what you're actually talking about. And they did whatever they wanted in that translation. Sorry, Ryan. Thousands of people have double-checked Jerome's work over the centuries, and aside from a few grammatical solecisms that were inherent to the languages, they find that his translations hold up pretty well. In fact, Jerome's translations are so highly regarded for their accuracy and his humility that he is often held as the standard for all translators, primarily because he refused to allow dissenting opinions, regardless of their position, to influence his work. I won't lie to you, Ryan. The fact that you've already demonstrated a dishonest foundation, gotten your history wrong, and then cloaked that error in a conspiracy, and all before you've actually presented your evidence for God, does not look good. However, I am rather curious as to what exactly you're trying to psychologically anchor your audience to before you present your evidence. But the original Greek and Hebrew remained. This isn't true, at least not how Ryan here is presenting it. One of the reasons Jerome's work was so heavily criticized by Augustine was the quality of unevenness in the language. Due to the complex nature of the languages Jerome was working with, his translations wound up with several grammatical solecisms that reproduced a number of idioms as they appeared in the Septuagint, hence the grammatical overlap. And then they wouldn't let you common peasants read it. It's generally concluded by modern scholars that the councils decreed that the Bible should be withheld from the masses as a part of a concentrated effort to divest their proposed Messiah from his Jewish origins. Because what good is a religion for controlling people for if you don't control the narrative and wind up empowering an oppositional faith? And when a king set forth the largest scholarly endeavor in history to translate this book into the common language of the people... They tried to blow him up along with the entire English parliament. Ah, this is in reference to King James I, who was a Protestant, and his commission of a new English translation of the Bible in 1604. Working largely from the English translations of John Wycliffe and William Tyndale, the King James Bible was officially completed in 1611. However, there was an effort to try and stop this. Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder, treason, and plot. Guy Fawkes, who was a radical Catholic, attempted to assassinate King James I in what is historically known as the Gunpowder Plot of 1605. Fox and his co-conspirators wanted to replace James with his daughter, Princess Elizabeth, who was also a Catholic, and to re-establish Catholic control over the Church of England. However, while these events highlight one of the many battles between Catholics and Protestants over control of the Christian narrative, none of them entail that the Abrahamic God actually exists. So if the history lesson is over, Ryan, let's get to the evidence. But now they've discredited it for you, and they had to, because the same fellas that brought you that Latin Vulgate you weren't allowed to read 
brought you the modern sciences built on a foundation of seismology and astronomy. Wow, this kind of went off the rails. Essentially, what this centerfold for scurvy monthly is asserting is that the very councils who decreed that the Bible should not be in the hands of the people, as a part of an effort to strengthen their control over the Christian narrative, then turned around and created the fields of science that today are often used to debunk the claims of the Bible. And all because you think they lost control of the Bible to the Protestants, despite the fact that the Catholics and Protestants each have their own preferred Bible. Setting aside the contradictory and ultimately conspiratorial nature of his claim, I want to look at the two fields that Ryan referenced, astronomy and seismology. As far as astronomy goes, the study of the movements of the planets and stars is something that humans have been doing since the Assyro-Babylonians around 1000 BCE. And it was the ancient Greeks who treated astronomy as a branch of sophisticated mathematics who developed three-dimensional models of planetary motion in the 4th century BCE. The field has just progressed from there, as our mathematical precision and technological prowess have improved over time. As for seismology, that field has its roots in ancient China, where Zhang Hang invented the first seismoscope in 132 CE. So we can see by history alone that these two particular fields, among many others, were not created by the Catholic Church. They were established by individuals who lived in ancient civilizations that predated the Catholic Church by centuries. The Catholic Church, with its vast power and influence, merely attempted to control the influence of advancing scientific fields, as those fields were, and still are, the greatest threat to the supernatural claims of their holy book. You're getting pretty bad with the appeals to conspiracy here, Ryan. I know, let's get to the evidence. To become the high priest of the new religion once more. Oh, so many conspiracies, so little time. Historically, the Catholic Church has been quite patronly of the sciences. But in their effort to spread belief in their God by improving humanity's understanding of reality, they unwittingly sowed the seeds of their eventual demise, the very fields of science that they supported eventually concluding that God was an unsuitable explanation for any given phenomena. And they obviously don't wield any control over the scientific advancements of today, because while the Catholic Church may occasionally raise its head and try to stymie the furthering of our understanding of reality, any attempts to wrest control are quickly seen and called out. Honestly, it was a battle they already lost during the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. It also appears here that Ryan is ignorantly asserting science as the new religion. Which is patently absurd because religion is predicated on the worship of supernatural entities and the use of faith to justify personal truths. Whereas science, at its methodological core, eliminates faith in favor of evidence in a continuing effort to identify and explain what is true about reality regardless of what one desires to be true. And that new religion is just like the Latin Vulgate. They took the truth like they had from the Hebrew and the Greek and they twist it into a lie to serve their own purposes to reign over you as gods. Okay, this is yet another conspiracy regarding scientists and their motives. I strongly doubt that many of the millions of scientists who have made the millions of advancements throughout time wanted to be worshipped as gods, especially the ones who believe that science and religion are complementary and not antagonistic. Come on, Ryan, are you going to get to this bombshell evidence for your god anytime soon? Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Get on with it! What do you think royal bloodlines even are? I don't know, a scientifically illiterate and racially motivated attempt by medieval royal families to maintain the purported purity of their bloodlines and by extension their asserted sovereignty? Who died and made them kings? The Lady of the Lake, her arm clad in the purest shimmering Samite, held aloft Excalibur from the bosom of the water, signifying by divine providence that I, Arthur, was to carry Excalibur. That is why I'm your king. Now the rest of what I'm about to tell you is published science. I dare you to refute me. Tag Neil deGrasse Tyson, I don't care. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson, you lididdical troglodyte. And if you honestly don't care, then why the hell are you making a video about it? The published science under the new Gnostic doctrine states that every single structure in the universe, whether it be an atom or a cell or a molecule or a man or a bacteria or a galaxy or a solar system, a structure, is the same structure. Small or big, you're just zooming in or out, that's it. They even plotted this on a graph, it's just one structure scaling, there's an equal distance between all of them. 
Asserting that all published science is somehow entirely dictated by Gnostic doctrines is yet another conspiracy. One that only serves to try and discredit all of science as being inherently biased against Christianity and attempting to obfuscate what is true. Get this through your malnourished head, Ryan. Just because science demonstrates your Bible is incorrect does not entail that science is inherently biased against the Bible. This is nothing more than you starting from the presupposition that the Bible is true and the inerrant word of God, something you have yet to demonstrate the actual truth of, and then concluding from that assumption that anything that discredits the Bible must possess an inherent bias against it. As for the Gnostic claim, Gnosticism is the belief that human beings carry a piece of God within themselves. And Gnostics are dualists, as opposed to Christians who are monists. And while Christians seek to eradicate sin, Gnostics seek to eradicate ignorance. So what I think Ryan is attempting to do here is to prop up all the various fields of science as a sort of neo-Gnostic pantheon, with all of their founders as their new godheads. And I'm a little confused by Ryan's use of the term structure here. Typically, structure is defined as the arrangement of or relations between the parts or elements of something complex. And while all physical objects obviously have structure, they are demonstrably not identical. A bacterium does not have the same structure as a star. It seems to me that Ryan is erroneously using the term structure here when he actually means category, in that of all the various categories of things in the universe, they all possess some form of physical structure. But this being the case does not logically entail the existence of any gods, let alone the Abrahamic God. Dead center between a star and an atom is a man. The absurdity of Ryan's graph assertion is easily demonstrated with basic observations and mathematics. Given the scope and nature of the universe, if you were to plot everything that exists out on a scale from smallest to largest, you would have an object at every possible number. Which entails that to assert equivalent size ratios between objects in the universe would require cherry picking of the data to support that claim. For clarity, the average height of Homo sapiens is 1.63 meters. This, however, does not indicate the average size of a human. That is something that would entail the average height-weight ratio of a human. As for atoms, they don't really have a height, unless you're talking the distance from the nucleus to the electron orbit. Atoms are, however, about 100 picometers, or 10 to the negative 10 meters, in diameter. However, their atomic weights vary considerably, which means you'd have to cherry pick a particular atom to match the size ratio of a human. And when it comes to stars, Ryan is equally selective, because our sun, which is a yellow dwarf, is not even representative of the average size of stars in the universe. Red dwarf stars are actually the most commonly observed stars, and they are considerably smaller in both size and mass than our own sun. So what Ryan is doing here is cherry picking the data he needs to support his claim and being deliberately loose with his terminology. Also, he can apply some sort of predictive numerology to the size scales of the universe. But as we can see, a cursory examination of the evidence quickly reveals his intellectual dishonesty. Now, knowing that every structure in the universe is just the same thing over and over, repeated in different sizes, you can include every single discipline of known science to what I'm about to say. Well, Ryan, I've already debunked your dishonest assertion about the size scales in the universe, and I fail to see how that's even applicable to all the fields of science. But maybe this is where he'll finally reveal his evidence. Every known structure of the universe goes through one pattern. Birth, it comes into existence. Growth, it gains information. Entropy, it becomes unstable and begins to lose that information. Death. Rebirth, everything does it. I swear, if this boy were any looser with his terminology, he'd get picked up for solicitation. But regardless of how much Ryan poetically conflates his terminology, the cyclical systems that we observe in the universe do not logically entail that a god exists. Spring, summer, winter, fall, even history repeats this pattern every 80 years. That would be the Strauss-Howe generation theory, and despite how interesting it actually is, it has nothing to do with whether or not a god exists. The moon as it waxes and wanes. An egg that hatches a caterpillar that grows and enters the cocoon only to start over as a butterfly. A sperm living and dying to become a baby. A nebula dying to become a star, a star dying to become a black hole. 
Congratulations, Ryan. You paid attention in elementary school. But I'm curious, will we be arriving at a point anytime soon? They tell you the Bible is a lie because they lost control of it and it contains the truth for you. Well, there's a positive claim about the Bible there. And we can demonstrate how there are claims about the world in the Bible that are incorrect. Which, when you consider the relative scientific ignorance of the people who wrote it, is something you would expect to see. And the church didn't lose control over the Bible, Ryan. It lost its control over science. Jesus said even the rocks could cry out, and that's true. What could they say? You must be born again. Is that it? Did you employ all of those emotional appeals just so you could butcher Luke 1940, which isn't even meant to be a literal statement, and then claim it to be evidence for your God? Well, Ryan, I honestly can't say that I'm surprised. Every single argument I've ever heard for a God has thus far boiled down to an argument from incredulity, an argument from ignorance, or an appeal to emotion. And it would seem that the official perfumer of Game and Fish here is no different. I'd strongly recommend that he make his way back to civilization, maybe have a sandwich, and attend a few courses on, like, you know, everything. Because as it stands, this first-to-be-eliminated-alone contestant is not bringing much to the table while he's standing out there in the woods playing with his stamen. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And hit that bell for notifications. And be sure to leave a comment below. I love reading your responses, and those interactions help with the dreaded algorithm. And don't forget, August is Immunization Awareness Month. A link on how you can help these efforts is down in the description. And if you love scary movies, be sure to check out me and my filmmaker friends over at the Week in Horror podcast, now in our third season. Everything you need to become a channel member here, nab yourself some official Bridge the Divide, swag or support the podcast is down in the description below once again thank you all so much for your continued support and as always be safe be excellent to each other and together we can bridge the divide